Immunity of the fetus and the newborn. When a mammal is born, it is exposed to a world of microorganisms, all of which their immune system has never encountered. A newborn is extremely susceptible to infection in the first few weeks of their life. Thankfully, they get a little help from their mom through the passive transfer of antibodies and some T-cells. How does this happen? Let's go back to when the fetus was still in the uterus. There's this little structure known as the placenta. In humans, other primates, and rodents, the placenta is hemochorial. That is, the maternal blood is in direct contact with the lining epithelium of the fetal chorion. This allows maternal immunoglobulin G to transfer directly to the fetus. In these animals, the newborn emerges with IgG levels comparable to that of its mother. Most carnivores, like dogs and cats, have endothelial choreal placentas, which means they have an additional layer between the maternal blood and the lining epithelium of the chorion, the endothelial lining of the blood vessel. This means that only 5-10% to of immunoglobulins transfer from mom to fetus. The rest must be obtained through means that will be discussed later. Ruminants, which include cattle, sheep, and goats, have syndesmochorial placentas, which has a connective tissue layer in addition to the layers shown previously. Notice the pattern of adding more layers? Because in horses and pigs, the placenta is epithelial, which gets an additional epithelial lining to all of this. So in these two groups, no immunoglobulins can pass from the mother to the fetus. Thus, newborns are completely dependent on this next thing we're going to talk about for their immunity. Colostrum and milk. Proteins are actively transferred from the mother's bloodstream to the mammary gland during the last few weeks of pregnancy. As a result, the first milk secreted after parturition, known as colostrum, is rich in immunoglobulins and lymphocytes. As lactation progresses, this changes into milk. The composition of these two varies among species. Here is a table showing the different concentrations of immunoglobulins in colostrum and milk in different species. You can pause if you want to take notes. In primates and dogs, IgA is predominant in both colostrum and milk. In pigs, horses, and cats, IgG predominates in colostrum then transitions into predominantly IgA in milk. And in ruminants, IgG is predominant in both colostrum and milk. It is imperative that the animal drinks colostrum very soon after birth, ideally within the first day or two of being born. This is because in the newborn's gastrointestinal tract, the enzymes that degrade protein are still very low. Immunoglobulins or antibodies are protein. And what's more, there are enzyme inhibitors that prevent the enzymes present from activating on the antibodies. Another reason is that the enterocytes possess FC receptors that facilitate the absorption of IgG and IgM into the bloodstream. IgA remains in the lumen because of its secretory component. After the first two days have passed, these enterocytes are replaced with new enterocytes that don't have the FC receptor. So yeah, it's important to drink colostrum before this happens. If the newborn successfully drinks colostrum within the immediate time frame, they would have antibody levels almost equivalent to that of their mom. Thereafter, they should still drink milk for sustenance and intestinal immunity, as the antibodies in milk simply remain in the lumen of the GIT and protect the animal from infection there. To recap, in this video, we talked about the passive immunity the newborn animal receives from its mother, first through the placenta in some animals, and then through colostrum and milk. We also talked about the importance of taking colostrum in the very first couple days of life. In the next video, we will talk about a small but significant downside to maternally derived antibodies.